About two days later, after the executive rear end attack, I went down to the legislative rear end again and took these pictures. By this time, I had heard from my source in the United States that the occupation of the legislative rear end was in fact ordered by the United States. However, the execution of it was done by an opposition leader. I was not able to get the name of the opposition leader. I was only told that it was a female. So you can interpret that there's only one opposition female leader at this time. Now my interpretation of why the United States would give this order has changed over time. At the time, I simply felt that the United States didn't want mainland China to get an upper hand over Taiwan economically. While this may be true, I feel that there is more behind this move by the United States. Keep in mind that this happened during the Obama administration. It is not necessarily true that the Democrats are automatically more friendly to mainland China than the Republicans. The cross strait Surface Trade Agreement was clearly crossing the red line for the United States. On the surface of things, it looked like it was crossing the red line for the general public. And for some parts of the general public, I'm sure it did. However, the main point of all of it was that it was crossing the line for the United States. The source of this information was from a U.S. think tank based in Washington, D.C. I was not given any written evidence. I don't know the name of the think tank, but I do believe that the information was legitimate. Over the years, I have received information from this source, and usually it's about the same. The United States basically backs up the DPP to commit illegal actions in Taiwan when the KMT or when a situation crosses the United States red line. Generally, the U.S. wants the DPP to stay in power when the presidential election is coming up. If they don't have enough popular support, election fraud is the way. Sometimes this succeeds, sometimes it doesn't succeed. It depends on the ability of the DPP to commit the election fraud. However, by default, the United States always wants the DPP in power in Taiwan. But that does not mean the U.S. wants the DPP to actually pursue Taiwan independence. They simply want to keep the movement alive without it ever reaching its goal. In 2014, occupying the legislative yuan was approved by the United States. Trying to occupy the executive yuan was definitely not a part of their plan though. There was nothing to gain by going after the executive yuan as far as the United States was concerned. They just wanted to stop the passing of the cross strait Service Trade Agreement. Occupying the legislative yuan for a period of time was enough to achieve this goal. The longer Lin Feifan and the rest of the students stayed in the legislative yuan, the more it looked like they wanted to start operating as the Republic of Taiwan. This was crossing the line for the United States, and the students were ordered out of the legislative rian soon afterwards. So looking back on the Sunflower Movement, the order first comes from the United States, then gets passed to the DPP party, then the students and the young people get mobilized in order to occupy the legislative rian. That's basically how it happened. Why did the Mayanjo government back off? probably due to pressure from the United States. In short, you could say, Mainjo basically got bullied. People blame Mainjo for being soft, but there must have been something going on between the US and the Ma administration to get them to back off from passing the trade deal which had already been signed between Taiwan and mainland China. So why was the cross strait Service Trade Agreement crossing a red line for the United States? Well, the obvious reason would be that it would serve as a tool for economic unification and eventual political unification, due to the fact that many industries would be opened up to mainland investment in Taiwan, including telecommunications. However, I believe that there is a more simple reason for all of this. From the U.S.'s point of view, the more Taiwan and mainland China's economies get merged together, the safer the situation becomes for Taiwan. Safer as in there's less chance for war. Taiwan is far less likely to go in the direction of Taiwan independence if the economies are more merged. The more mainland China is invested in Taiwan, the less likely they are to attack it. However, this is not the situation the United States wants. The United States wants Taiwan, the Republic of China, to be in a permanent state of nearly being in a war with mainland China, the People's Republic of China. With this threat of war, Taiwan has to continue to purchase weapons from the United States. This keeps the U.S. war industry going. Since Taiwan came to power, arms purchases from the United States have increased considerably. This is what the U.S. is looking for as far as the Taiwan region is concerned. They are looking for sales. The Taiwan independence movement helps push sales from the U.S. to Taiwan. Peace is definitely not a good thing. Economic integration is definitely not what the U.S. is looking for. I mentioned in my last video 
that the U.S. allegedly approached Hungary before the election on January 11th and asked him if he was going to purchase the F-16 fighters. He allegedly said no. Apparently, he said he would be purchasing from another source. This was definitely not a good thing for the United States. We now know that Taiwan plans to purchase not just 66 F-16 jets, but possibly more and for a much higher price. However, the quantity and the price is unclear, and the illegal Thai administration has now confirmed what the amount really is. In fact, they are going after YouTubers who are reporting this. Despite the fact that international news has already been reporting that Taiwan is going to be purchasing F-16 jets over a 10-year period, for 62 billion US dollars. While not all of the jets may be for Taiwan, the details of this purchase are very unclear. It behooves the illegal Thai administration to explain the details of this purchase instead of threatening prosecution against people who are reporting something that is in international news. Because either way, Lockheed Martin apparently has this order placed for 62 billion US dollars. I want to address the intensifying attacks verbal, rhetorical, diplomatic, economic, coming from the United States and directed at the People's Republic of China. If it concerns you, good, it means you're paying attention. It is something that is going to be of growing importance in the years ahead and possibly of catastrophic importance. So it is very worthwhile examining what's going on. The initiative for all of this is the United States. China is on the receiving end of U.S. attacks, provocations, criticisms, demonizations, you name it. The Chinese re react, to use the words of an American diplomat, in measured tones. What's going on? Here are the reasons the United States is doing that. I'm going to give you three major reasons, not in order of importance, but in order to give you the context within which to evaluate what's going on. The military. The Cold War with Russia from 1946 until 1989 had a lot to do with the fact that the United States economy totally committed to World War II and was producing for war starting around 1939 and 40 all the way to 1946. And the great fear in the United States at the end of World War II was that the economy would sh shrink back, fall back at the end of the war. No more war production, no more millions of people in the military, that we would go back to the Great Depression of the 1930s that had preceded the war. One of the ways to prevent that was to keep the military going. And the only way you could keep spending vast sums of money on the military is if we had a credible enemy. With the Germans defeated and the Japanese defeated, we had no credible enemy. So the Soviet Union and a Cold War with them was the substitute. It solved the problem. It gave us the enemy that justified the military. But in 1989, the Soviet Union collapsed. We tried to make it a war against terrorism that would last forever to justify the military. But it's very hard to justify aircraft carriers against people who carry pea shooters in most parts of the world. It didn't work. We need a more credible enemy. And China is the only plausible candidate. In an economy that is dependent on the military-industrial complex, that Eisenhower, no less, warned us about, we should never underestimate the role played in our foreign policy by the need of an enemy to justify the vast expenditure, over $750 billion this year alone, on the military. So there you have it. Those are the major reasons driving all of this. Very dangerous, very tense, but don't be fooled. This has nothing to do with Hong Kong, and it has nothing to do with the abusive treatment of Muslim minorities. Whatever the truth of all of that is, it's beside the point. 
These are flashpoints picked up as part of the United States' trying to figure out how to come to terms with its needs. And because of the pandemic and because of the crash of capitalism we are living through, the needs are very intense, shake up our politics, and are reconceptualizing our relations with the rest of the world. China is being re-examined and re-positioned, if you like, in the American consciousness to accommodate fundamental economic and military needs that this troubled capitalism now faces. The other two reasons he gave were to cover up for the Trump administration's mishandling of the COVID pandemic, as well as the fact that mainland China has become an economic competitor to the United States after being partners for several decades. 